David, you can. Did you say I could begin? Yes. Okay. The recording of the progress trumped you out. I couldn't hear what you said. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, let's bow our heads for prayer. Loving God in heaven, we thank you so much for life. We pray, Lord, you would be uh, in the midst of us this evening, Lord. We thank you for all who have joined in, Lord. We pray that your spirit would be the guiding spirit, Lord, and that we would come away um, with a little increase of knowledge and your spirit to guide us along this path, Lord. So we thank you and praise you for all that you do. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay. So um, I got a share screen here. I have an article for us. Do you see anything? Not yet. Okay, I'm just trying here. Okay. Start broadcast. Two, one. Okay. Okay. Let's try. See what we can get now. How about that? Yes. See. Okay. Well, again, welcome everyone. So um, this article here is called conversion therapy, and this is an article that I was looking at that um, it goes to the effect that um, it's not a choice, let's just say. And this is sort of evidence um, that is being shown that um, LGBTQ people, AI plus, are not choosing this. And when you try and do something to um, force them out of it, not good things happen. So um, with that being said, that's sort of the, the uh, premise behind this article. It's not really that long, but this article was, as uh, you can see there, um, written in nine, or 2019, and it's by the American Medical Association. And the right below that, is you can see if you'd like to um, go and read this same article. I put in some pictures and you know livened it up so we're not like, um, let's just say, not bored. <laughs> Anyways, this article here, um, it talks about the following things. It addresses the following things. That's the health implications of conversion therapy the ethical concerns on conversion therapy, health, uh, state laws, and finally, uh, medical society and other healthcare associations, their positions on uh, conversion therapy. So the background, so-called conversion therapy return, refers to any form of intervention such as individual or group, behavioral, cognitive, or milieu environmental operations, the milieu is a person's social environment, that attempts to change an individual's sexual orientation or sexual behavior. Uh, sexual orientation change efforts, they refer in this article, is, you'll see this S-O-C-E a lot, and then they use G-I-C-E a lot, and that's for uh, gender identity um, change efforts. So that's a little of the background. Um, 
the practitioners of change efforts may employ different techniques. And these techniques really opened my eyes up to see that, you know, they really go all out to try and uh, make a change in these people's basic core lives, beliefs. And those include um, adverse conditioning. And when they say adverse conditioning, that's a nice way of saying they use electrical shock. Mm. And they use like starvation. It says deprivation of food and liquids. Um, they also use smelling salts. And I, I was going to look that up, but I didn't. But, you know, smelling salts is when you pass out. And apparently, if you're still breathing and you inhale it, oh, it yeah. jerks you. Oh, Kathy tells me it's ammonia. It jerks you right awake. So that's kind of drastic. And chemically induced nausea. Those are the top of the list of the things that they like to employ as some of their techniques. They also use biofeedback, hypnosis, and masturbation reconditioning. And you see the number two after reconditioning, that refers you down here to the references. And you'll see that throughout the article. Underlying these techniques is the assumption that homosexuality and gender identity are mental disorders and that sexual orientation and gender identity can and should be changed. So I put in the bolded here and I put in the underlying. That was not in the article, just so you know. These are things that I thought we might want to either discuss about or um, just refer to as notable. And if there's any discussion, please jump right in. I will stop and uh, let any comments come in. So this assumption, and that was the assumption that um, it's a mental disorder. This assumption is not based on medical and scientific evidence. Professional consensus rejects pathologizing homosexuality, in other words, turning it into a disease, and differences in gender identity. In addition, empirical evidence has demonstrated that homosexuality and trans and non-binary gender identities are normal variations of human identity and expressed not inherently linked to mental illnesses. However, the unfounded misconception of sexual orientation and gender identity conversion persists today in some health, spiritual, and religious practitioners. They have their own agendas, let's just say. According to the UCLA Williams Institute on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Law and Public Policy as of the year 2018, almost 700,000 lesbians, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer slash questioning, LGBTQ adults in the US had received conversion therapy. In addition, an estimated, fifth, yeah, that's a big number. I would say it's approaching a million there, almost three quarters of a million. Yeah. So in addition, an estimated 57,000 youths receive change efforts from religious or healthcare providers before they uh, turn 18 years old. So there's quite a sizable number of youth that are subjected to this. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, a national survey of over 25,000 LGBTQ youths ages 12 to 24, found 67% of respondents reported that someone tried to convince them to change their sexual orientation or gender identity. So that's, you know, at least two thirds, 67%. 5% respondents reported that they were subjected to conversion therapy. Another study found that nearly 18% of middle-aged or older men who have, who have sex with men reportedly experiencing conversion therapy. The study also identified 
racial inequity, which is interesting. Black and Hispanic men uh, were more likely to experience conversion therapy compared to a non-Hispanic. So you can see that little inequity there. Why are they picking on these guys more than other people? I don't really um, figure that one out, but um, that's just what they reported. So moving on, the next section here is, as I mentioned before, one of the uh, subtitles is the health implication of LGBTQ individuals. Okay, so we all know that we all have health. It's either for good or for bad. And um, we all would hope that everything that happens to us in life is not a detriment, but there's not always that pretty picture. And this is showing that that's the way it is. So the evidence does not support the purported efficacy of SOCE in changing sexual orientation. To the contrary, these practices may cause significant psychological distress. One study showed that 77% of ex-SOCE participants reported significant long-term harm, including the following symptoms. So here we go again, here's three quarters of the people that have this they don't just have harm for like the weekend or whatever, and then they get out and go home and they're all normal again. No, it's a long-term kind of problem um, that they have to bear. So this long-term problems include depression, not a good thing, anxiety, still not good, lowered self-esteem. I mean, these people are beaten up, internalized homophobia, self-blame. I mean, that's just wrong, intrusive, imagery and sexual dysfunction. All these things are from what? From going through 75, 77% of the people from going through the, uh, the therapy, excuse me. <coughs> Participants also reported significant social and interpersonal harm, such as alienation, loneliness, social isolation, uh, interference with intimate relationships, and loss of social support. So really cutting the legs out from under these people socially is it's just a, a really tough thing for these people, as you can imagine. So SOCE, SOCE may also increase suicidal behavior. So you can see when you're talking about depression, anxiety, and lower self-esteem, what's the next thing on the list? Suicide. Mm -hmm. So it uh, increases suicidal behavior in a population where suicide is prevalent. That's just bad already. In young adults between 15 and 24 years old, suicide has been the second leading cause of death since 2011 and LGBTQ young adults are more than twice as likely to report a history of suicide attempts in comparison to their heterosexual peers. Similar LGB adults are three to five times more likely to have a suicidal attempt in comparison uh, to their heterosexual counterparts. So you can see the odds get higher and higher for these poor people. Young LGBTQ adults who report higher levels of parental and caregiver rejection are 8.4 times more likely to report having attempted suicide. So you can see caregivers and parents really have a lot to do with um, let's just say maybe the outcome of these people it depends on how they're treated mm -hmm. and we as a movement know that we are to accept everybody and I would say go maybe the extra mile to make these people realize that um, we accept them and we don't reject them and we're not you know, against everything they stand for and everything like that, which is 
in the Christian world will be the oddity as we all understand. Okay, one study found nearly 30%, that's a third almost, of individuals who underwent um, sexual orientation uh, reported suicidal attempts, S-O-C-E. Um, so a third of the people almost are attempting suicide. Yeah, it's very prolific. Okay, gender identity change efforts may cause similar long-term harm as sexual orientation change efforts. An analysis of the 2015 National Transgender Survey found that recalled exposure to uh, GICE was significantly associated with increased severe psychological distress and increased lifetime suicide attempts compared to transgender person who reported that they saw a therapist but were not exposed to conversion therapy. Yeah, so in addition, exposure to GICE prior to age 10, and that just seems so young, was significantly associated with an increased risk of lifetime suicide attempts. Lifetime suicide attempts, increased mm -hmm. risk. Yeah. So, you know, the poor kids, you know, it's not like they got a choice of anything. And at that age, they're not likely to tell off their parents or whoever else is trying to, you know, uh, convert them. And they're yeah. just usually just kind of go along with that because they're 10 years old and, you know, they're still trying to get life figured out. Uh, and it's just uh, really pretty bad that it is an increase for lifetime suicide yeah. attempts. Yes, I uh, yeah. read an article um, not too long ago that was so sad that uh, I think he was eight years old, this young boy. Um, the school children, uh, classmates, um, some of them were telling him that he was going to hell because he was yeah. gay and he, he killed himself. And there's been several yeah. stories and they're just so young and they're already being told, mm -hmm. you know, that they're, yeah. yeah, that they're worthless. It's really sad. It is. I mean, horrible. Kids are, kids can be very cruel. Mm -hmm. I probably couldn't say that I was not guilty of, well, not this, but other things when I was young. Yeah. Another study found that 23% of LGBTQ youth who reported that someone had attempted to convince them to change their sexual orientation or gender identity had attempted uh, suicide, 23%, compared to 8% of those who did not report that others tried to convince them to change their sexual orientation or gender identity. So we have quite a bit of difference between those that no one tried to force them into it or convince them, I should say, to the ones that were. Uh, among those subjected to conversion therapy, okay, there now they went through the program, 42% reported that they had attempted uh, to commit suicide while suicide attempts were reported by 5% of those not subjected to conversion therapy. So very high numbers here. And here's some more of uh, the references. Uh, I found this on PBS. Yes. Um, yes. I have a question and I'm sorry if, if it was mentioned, but I, I don't know if I heard it or missed it. Um, is are any of these therapies connected to um, the Protestant religious right, or is this just scientific studies um, based on health statistics, but not like who's doing this conversion therapy? Yeah, in the beginning it says uh, if I could find it. 
it talked about religious uh, organizations. And yeah, the yeah. religious right, they're in there. I, I yeah. couldn't tell you which one. And now I don't seem to see where, oh, here it is. However, the unfounded misconception of sexual orientation and gender identity conversion persists today in the health. Spiritual and religious practitioners are involved in this. Okay. Have you heard and, of and that? I, I was going to say, Deb, did you hear about that man who was the, the leader of this organization called Exodus? And how he, I forget how many years, 20 or 30 years, he was running this organization. And he finally um, quit and said what they were doing was wrong. And he had been converted and he realized that you, that can't happen. And uh, it was quite a uh, shocker to the um, Protestants to hear this man totally demolish their whole um, foundation on, you know, saying that this can be, because they would have people who would say, yes, I've been converted and all that other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And so you can, um, you can see, imagine the, the, how much worse people would be knowing that God hates them. Yeah. God's yeah. unhappy with them. They're, they're a defect. They're, you know, there's, there's something wrong with them. And, you know, how hopeless can that be, right? Just the feeling oh. that even God himself doesn't accept you. Yes. Yeah. That's, yeah, huge. Yeah. Is that was that a part of I, that I, pray away movie? Um, oh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I just remember reading an article about this man um, um, talking about his experience with this organization and how wrong it was. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Kathy. I I did hear something. I don't remember. It's been a while. If, Maybe mm -hmm. it was the same one, but it was a, somebody from the inside that kind of blew the whistle. Mm -hmm. And um, more okay. of that needs to happen. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm not sure if the Adventist church does this or not, but it wouldn't surprise me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're down to the ethical concerns, okay? And the ethical concern says that all leading professional medical and mental health associations reject conversion therapy. Who does it? All the leading medical and uh, mental health association as a law, a they reject it as a legitimate medical treatment. In addition to the clinical risk associated with the practice, the means uh, through which providers or counselors administer change efforts, guess what it does? Mm -hmm. Violates many important ethical principles. And mm -hmm. most everybody's heard of first, do no harm. And it's, it's amazing that the facts are out there, but yet, you know, they're ignored. And that's kind of the world we're living in now. It, the facts are really not the matter. What's telling what the matter is? It's it's whatever you believe, and and the facts, you know, that they, they can get thrown out of the window real quickly. So it should be a warning to anybody doing this <coughs> that there's plenty of information showing that it's no good. All right, a healthcare provider's non-judgmental recognition of and respect for patient sexual orientations sexual behaviors and gender identity are essential elements in rendering optimal patient care in health as well as in uh, illness. So what I should underline there was non-judgmental recognition of this. This recognition is especially important to address the specific healthcare needs of people who are or may be LGBTQ as these patients often experience disparities in access to care. So you can imagine now you don't even want to go to the doctor. Most people don't anyways, unless they get, they're hurting bad. And then when you go in, you know what? They're, 
disparaging you. And if they find out that, you know, who you are, if you're an LGBT, it's, um, it's got to be just, just totally discouraging. Yet in ministering change efforts is inherently discriminatory practice, often administered coercively and fraught with ethical problems. Okay, so we're going to go into this. How does this discrimination takes place? And you'd think that'd be a red flag right there. But, you know, it gets swept under the rug. So here's some of the ways. Um, there's uninformed consent. Uh, change efforts, efforts are often prescribed without full description of risk and disclosures of lack of efficacy or evidence. So you'd think that when you're going to have a procedure, you always want to know, like, okay, what are the odds of not happening? What, you know, could be the side effects? What are they going to actually do? Are they going to actually uh, stick uh, electrical probes to my brain or something and shock me or starve me or, you know, all of these things? I, I don't think too many people would probably submit to this if they really yeah. knew kind of how this is all going to go. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think I would want to. Let's put it that way. Okay, so what are other uh, ethical problems? Breaches of confidentiality. I mean, that kind of goes on now, you know, in, in so many different areas. It used to be like, oh, we're not supposed to, you know, let anybody know anything that. And I remember back when the day when I was supposed to uh, take flu shots of the hospital, and I was like, I don't need those. I wore the mask, you know, for the six months or whatever it was. But, you know, what? my confidentiality was breached because I had to wear a little blue tag on my name tag. And so everybody knew, okay. He didn't take it. So, you know, there was a HIPAA violation right there in the hospital. Oh, yeah. So, bre yeah, breaches of confidence is crazy. Anyways, uh, content and treatment, sexual orientation, and gender identity may be shared with who? Family, schools, your church, and all without what? You're supposed to sign a paper? No, this is just like done, you know, carte blanche. And so many people find out about these things. So you can see there's lots of easily breached confidentiality. Another uh, ethical problem would be um, patients' discrimination. Change efforts reinforce what? Bias. People start already going down that path. Discrimination and stigma against LGBTQ people. There's more to the list. Indiscriminate and improper treatment. Okay, so change efforts are recommended regardless of evidence. So, I mean, this everything we ever learned in a hospital was like, if you're doing something to a patient, it's got to be evidence-based, evidence-based, evidence-based. And so, you know, to throw all this stuff at these people, it, I think it's it's just really goes out the side. That's why I, I believe that the medical professions, you know, when they see the evidence, they have to just throw the whole thing out. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I'm sure they'd be culpable too. Uh, and more ethical problems is patient blaming. The failure of treatment may be blamed on the patient. Oh, that's like saying, you know, I had an operation and it failed that it was my fault, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, it, it just gets pretty sad. Okay, it is clinically and ethically inappropriate for healthcare providers to direct mental or behavioral health interventions, including SOCE and GICE, with a prescriptive goal aimed at achieving a fixed developmental outcome of a child's or adolescent sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. Inappropriate. Okay, so if you're in the hospital, don't suggest that. <laughs> now, here we go. Here's the laws, and I like this because things are changing, and you know there needs to be a lot more change, of course, to protect these people. But here's what the state laws uh, in to this date, and that was in 2019. I think this was written. Um, yeah, it was November. You have 2019. There was 18 states that 
uh, ban the conversion therapy. So if you live in California, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Hawaii, Illinois, Maryland, Nevada, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, or New Mexico, Maine, Massachusetts, Oregon, Rhode Island, Vermont, Washington, and Washington, D.C., they all have enacted laws banning conversion therapy for minors. So I'm thinking, okay, yeah, if you're older than 18, I guess you can make your own decisions about these crazy things. Importantly, these laws do not prohibit counseling and therapies that help patients struggling with sexual or gender identity to develop coping and self-acceptance skills. It's amazing that yeah. it's only 18 states. Mm -hmm. Yes. And this. Which, yeah, and you start thinking about this and what's going on with abortion and all these LGBT <laughs> rights they're trying to take away and stuff. And you start thinking, oh, I wonder if any of these states are going to turn around and, right. and, you know, and, and strike down the laws or something crazy, right? Yeah. Mm. Um, I don't see Texas on the list here, no. or Arkansas. Or Arkansas. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So those being off the list, you know, they probably, you know, won't have the opportunity to, to turn the ban around, but they probably would never ban this. They, probably if you had a kid and you felt crazy enough that you needed to do this, you'd send them to one of those places and they, it would be legal. You know, I just can't imagine how this would turn out, but Anyways, I'm glad at least there's 18 states. Um, so next, what we want to discuss on here is the Medical Society and other health care associations. What are their positions on these things? And there's a list here. Okay, so the, the health care associations are like the American Medical Association and GLMA. They're the ones that, that uh, sponsored or wrote this article. And that GLMA is the old name for um, Gay and Lesbian Medical Association. It says here, Health Professionals Advancing LGBTQ Equality. I think that's the new name of it. They oppose the use of reparative or conversion therapy for sexual orientation or gender identity. Other medical societies have policies or statements similar opposing these policies. And here's the list, they include the American Psychiatric Association, American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, American College of Physicians, and American Academy of Pediatrics. Other healthcare associations include the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy, American Counseling Association, the American uh, Psychoanalytic Association, American Psychological Association, the National Association of Social Workers, Pan American Health Organization, and regional offices of WHO, the World Health Organization, have similar policies. So it's not one or two that are opposed to this, but they, there's a nice representation. I would hope that every one of them was there if they weren't even. Uh, mentioned in this. So here's the actual policy for the AMA. And this policy, you know, I'll run through it just to give us an idea of what they're really looking at. And we have the time to look at a little bit of this. So their policy is this H160 point dot dot dot. Healthcare needs of lesbians, gay, bisexual, and transgender gender po populations. <coughs> Excuse me. Number one, the AMA A, believes that the physician's non-judgmental recognition of patients' sexual orientations, sexual behaviors, and gender identities enhances the ability to render optimal patient care in health as well as in illness. In the case of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, slash questioning, and other G LGBTQ patients, this recognition is especially important to address the specific healthcare needs of people who are or may be LGBTQ. Okay, so there's special things, and there's a supposed to be non judgmental recognition of these patients. B, 
is committed to taking leadership role in doing what? Educating physicians on the current state of research in and knowledge of LGBTQ health and the need to elicit relevant gender and sexuality information for our patients. These efforts should start in medical school. And I don't know if they ever do that, but you know, you gotta start somewhere. It must be also be part of uh, continuing uh, medical education. Their CEUs have to cover some of this stuff. Education, educating physicians to recognize the physician and psychological needs of LGBTQ patients. Encouraging, number three, encouraging the development of educational programs in LGBTQ health. Four, encouraging physicians to seek out local or national experts in the healthcare needs of LGBTQ people so that all physicians will achieve a better understanding of the medical needs of these populations. And five, working with LGBTQ communities to offer physicians the opportunity to better understand the medical needs of LGBTQ patients. Uh, C, opposes the use of reparative or conversion therapy for sexual orientation or gender identity. That's all number one. And number two, the AMA will collaborate with our partner organizations to educate physicians regarding uh, the need for sexual gender minority individuals to undergo regular cancer and sexual transmitted infection screenings based on anatomy due to their comparable or elevated risk for these conditions. Nothing gets swept under the rug, they're hoping. The need for comprehensive screening for sexuality transmitted disease in men who have sex with men. Three, appropriate safe sex techniques to avoid the risk of sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, four, that individuals who identify as a sexual and or gender minority, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, slash questioning individuals experience intimate partner uh, violence and how sexual and gender minorities present with intimate partner violence differs from their cisgender heterosexual peers and may have unique complicating factors. So they're, they're pretty comprehensive of what they want these doctors to be looking at and addressing. Number three, our AMA will continue to work alongside our partner organizations, including the GLMA, which we mentioned earlier, to increase physicians' competency on LGBTQ health issues. Number four, AMA will continue to explore opportunities uh, to collaborate with other organizations focusing on issues of mutual concern in order to provide the most comprehensive and up-to-date education and information to enable the provision of high quality and culturally competent care for LGBTQ people. Okay, so the GLMA, it's the Gay Lesbian Medical Association Health Professionals, um, they have their own um, uh, laws, oh, it's a law, but I can't think of the word. It's GLMA 099-97-114. And they say about conversion therapy, GLMA health professionals advance LGBTQ equ equality cons condemns the behavior and psychological intervention known as reparative or conversion therapies that attempt to change sexual orientation and gender identity. So they're condemning it also. All right, that's the article. And then uh, Wikipedia gave a little, oh yeah, I threw in this little picture here on, you know, <laughs> you can't see the whole picture, but they're like holding this guy down and, you know, getting him all strapped up here with electrical devices to work on him. Mm -hmm. And Wikipedia is just a little short paragraph says, conversion therapy is the pseudoscientific practice of attempting to change an individual's sexual orientation from homosexual or bisexual to heterosexual or their gender identity from transgender or non-binary cisgender using 
psychological, physical, or spiritual interventions. There's that spiritual again. There is no reliable evidence that sexual orientation or gender identity can be changed. And medical institutions warn that conversion therapy practices are ineffective and potentially harmful. So I just want to put in that uh, the um, definition of pseudoscientific or pseudoscience, because mm -hmm. that's mentioned in this. Wikipedia calls it a pseudoscience. It consists of statements, beliefs, or practices that claim to be both scientific, that claim, keyword there, claim to be both scientific and factual, but are incompatible with the scientific method. Pseudoscience is often characterized by contradictory, exaggerated, or unfalsified claims. Reliance on confirmation bias rather than rigorous attempts at refutation. And that's put in by PBS report. <coughs> so it is a pseudoscience, it's not a real science. Mm -hmm. Okay, so anybody have any comments or questions or concerns or just anything? I just found it really I was hoping that this was the truth, but as I did find out it was the truth, I just was sort of saddened by, you know, the fact that it still goes on and, and it doesn't get stopped, you know, throughout the country. They're, they're still debating some of this over in Great Britain. I saw a little snippet on that, but I don't know how far they had gotten with uh, actually outright banning it or not. Mm. Maybe Parminder could tell us. Um, and I don't remember how uh, recent that um, fact was that they were trying to get rid of it over there. Mm -hmm. So. Yes, well, yeah. I think it's very, very good. It was informative, but as you say, it is, it's very disturbing, very sad. Yeah, it is. So. Um, I guess with that, we can uh, go into prayer and praise. All right.